Our next speaker uh, is Yoni Birman from uh, the Ministry of Defense. He's head, head of cybersecurity department. And he will uh, tell us about uh, using uh, deep learning, deep reinforcement learning uh, for uh, malware detection. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here at the AI conference. Uh, my name is Yoni Birman. I am the head of cybersecurity department at the Ministry of Defense. My department is in charge of developing and researching security software that uh, secures our organizational network from both incoming hazards in the forms of malware and online attacks and from outcoming hazards in the form of um, data leakages. I'll be presenting you a research I've been conducting in my PhD with my two colleagues, Shaked Dindi and Zivido, under the supervision of my professors, Asaf Shabtai and Gilad Katz. And this research is currently under implementation in the organization I'm working for. So viewing this illustration gives us a good notion of how a secure perimeter looks like. On the one hand, we have the internal network. But in order to secure it, we need to separate it from the, ex from the external network. We do it by the delimiter zone. In the delimiter zone, we will be putting all of our security tools. Specifically, since we're talking about malware detection, this is where we will be putting all of our malware detection tools. The delimiter zone is also known as the DMZ. Um, so when we're talking about an enterprise scale organizations, we'll usually have several different malware detection tools. In some cases, even some dozens of these tools. Um, these organizations, excuse me, um, so we'll have several dozens of, uh, of these tools. Now, since there is no obvious way of how to use them in order to classify a file, what the security officer will usually do he will be using all detectors in order to classify the file. So our research will be showing all the security officers that they were, that they were wrong. Now, one of the phenomena we see throughout last year is the fact that uh, new malware detectors appear on a daily basis. Each of these malware detectors poses to be the best malware detector in the market, outperforming the new ones in both detection-wise, accuracy-wise, and cost-wise. Now, this notion brings organization acquiring these malware detectors, and as time goes by, this organization are, are uh, putting out more money and expenses on these malware classifiers. And the data we see here was taken from a known cybersecurity website that shows that by the time of 2029, organizations would be spending approximately $5 trillion on malware detection uh, during one year. Excuse me. So when we're talking about malware detection, we see an evolutionary process occurring throughout the years. First, malware detectors started with the signature-based detectors. The signature-based detectors were used by the security researchers working for the antivirus companies. They were looking for patterns of malicious files in files and then uploading them to the antivirus DBs. These DBs were serving the antivirus companies and each, each time a malicious file uh, was seen by this classifier, he prevented them from executing on the operating system. Then, um, uh, machine learning has been adopted in the antivirus companies. Machine learning has brought two main things to the field of malware detection. First, it reduced the amount of researchers needed to find malwares. And secondly, uh, it enabled the, uh, the malware companies finding faster and easier all these malicious files. Lastly, uh, we have the ensemble-based method that uh, we encounter in the last few years. The general idea of ensemble-based method is instead of fighting them, join them. We're using all detectors we have, aggregating the results, and based on the result, we will be classifying distinctly the file. 
Now, the main disadvantage of ensemble-based methods is the fact that they are very expensive. Now, while we were talking about the different methods, we have uh, the basic thing we need, data. So there are two types of data we are using, static data and dynamic data. Extracting features can, be, uh, can happen in two ways. The first one is static analysis, where we, extract, we, where we extract data from the file without actually executing it. This type of data can be the binary data of the file, the operational codes of the file, or any metadata from this file. It is very cheap, it is very fast, and in most cases it is very accurate. But uh, there are many cases that without actually executing and watching the behavior of the file, we won't be able finding the malicious or hazards we have in this file. For example, in the use cases of metamorphism and polymorphism, static analysis won't always be good enough. The other type of feature extractors we have is using dynamic analysis. When using dynamic analysis, we actually execute the file in a virtual environment. While executing the file, we record the behavior of the file on both user mode and kernel mode. And based on this data, we can classify the file for malicious or benign. The main advantage of dynamic analysis is the fact that they are very accurate. The main disadvantage is the fact that they cost a lot because the infrastructure needed for executing the files costs a lot. And the time takes, that takes to execute the files um, is very long. So in the use cases where the business objective of your organization is maximizing the throughput, dynamic analysis won't be good enough for you. For example, if your organization is, deals with uh, emergencies or, or your organization, his quality of service depends on your time of response, dynamic analysis won't be good enough for you. So posing all types of classifiers and feature extractors on this graph gives us a good notion of the world of malware detection. We have here uh, two axes. The first one is the cost axis or the expenses, and the second one is the accuracy. Now to emphasize, let's take the lower left one, the signature-based static analysis. I suppose each of you have this one on his phone or his computer, or he can download it in one minute to his phone or computer. And on the other side, on the top right, we have the ensemble-based, both static and, and uh, dynamic classifier. Now this one, uh, probably none of you have ever seen this type of classifier. Um, I believe some big organization or corporates have this kind of classifiers. So the objective of the security officer of the organization is deciding where to put his organization on this graph. And it depends on several things. For example, how secure do you want to keep your organization? Or what is your organization budget? We'll be calling this the security policy of the organization. Now our research has three main motivations. The first motivation is reducing the classification costs while keeping the accuracy as high as possible. Secondly, we would like to reduce the dependency, the dependency in human. Since humans need to be involved in any process occurring in the classification environment, for example, changes of the classifiers or changing the thresholds of these classifiers, humans need to be involved. So we would like to reduce to the bare minimum um, human interaction. And lastly, our third objective is the ability of dynamically adapting to changes. We can add classifiers or remove classifiers, we can change the security policy of our organization, or changes can happen to each of our classifiers. We would like to have the ability of fastly and accurately adapting to these changes. So our solution is going to be using reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a known machine learning method. It is used in different domains, for example, robotics, bidding, games, automotive cars, and many others. The idea of reinforcement learning, as opposed to other machine learning algorithms, is the fact that it is a trajectory-based process that receives rewards, uh, unknown rewards for any action taken by the agent. Let's look at this illustration to elaborate. We have the agent. The agent has its state, 
and it has its policy on the basis of a neural network. The policy will tell the agent what action to take for any state he is in. When taking an action, this action will be executed in the environment, and the environment will uh, produce two values. The first one is the new state of the agent, and the second one is the reward. The reward um, tells the agent how good or bad was his action. Now, to further emphasize and see how reinforcement learning was implemented in different domains, I'll show you a short, a short video of how it was implemented in the field of gaming. On Earth, the simple rules of natural selection and competition led to the evolution of increasingly intelligent life forms. Today, we ask if comparably simple rules and multi-agent competition can also lead to intelligent behavior in a new virtual world. These agents are playing hide and seek. These agents have just begun learning, but they've already learned to chase and run away. This is a hard world for a hider who has only learned to flee. However, after training in millions of rounds of hide and seek, the hiders find a solution. The hiders learn to use rudimentary tools to their advantage. By grabbing and locking these blocks, they can create their own shelter. The seekers are locked in place for a brief period at the start of the game, giving hiders a chance to prepare. Even so, the hiders must learn to collaborate, accomplishing tasks that would be impossible for any single individual. The hiders are not the only ones who can learn to use tools. After many generations of failing to break into the shelter, the seekers learn to jump over obstacles using ramps. However, after many millions of rounds of having their shelter breached, the hiders learn to take away the primary tool the seekers have at their disposal. Note that we did not explicitly incentivize any of these behaviors. As each team learns a new skill, it implicitly changes the challenges the other team faces, creating a new pressure to adapt. We've also put these agents into a more open-ended environment, randomizing the objects, team sizes, and walls. In this world, they learn to construct their own shelter from scratch, requiring that they arrange multiple objects into precise structures. To prevent seekers from using the ramps, the hiders move them to the edge of the play area and lock them in place. We originally believed this would be the final strategy that the agents learn. However, we found that after more training, the seekers discover that they can jump on top of boxes and surf them to the hider's shelter. In the last stage of emergent strategy that we observe, the hiders learn to lock as many boxes as they can before constructing their fort in order to defend against box surfing. So how do agents acquire these skills? They're trained using reinforcement learning, an algorithm inspired by the way animals on Earth learn. The agents play thousands of rounds of hide-and-seek in parallel for many days. They train against each other as well as past versions of themselves using an algorithm called self-play. Co-evolution and competition on Earth led to the only generally intelligent species known to date, humans. While this world is far less complex than Earth, we have found evidence that simple rules can lead to increasingly intelligent behavior from multi-agent interaction. We hope So I hope you've all enjoyed this video and understood better how reinforcement, reinforcement learning works. So this is the general idea of our implementation of cost-effective malware detection using reinforcement learning. The agent has six actions he can take. Four actions are choosing to which classifier or malware detector to go and two actions of actually classifying the file. He has the option of classifying it as malicious or as benign. The state of the agent is represented by an n long vector, where n is the number of detectors used in the classification environment. The values that represent uh, each of these uh, malware detectors is between zero to one, where as closer we are to one means the detector thinks the file is malicious and as closer we are to zero, the detector thinks the, the file is closer to of being benign. When we see the value of minus one, it means that this specific file didn't mean this specific detector. Now the reward function we are using is the confusion-based matrix that tells us the actual reward for every type of correct or incorrect classification we made. The reward function depends on three variables. The first one is the cost function. 
that um, accumulates the time required by all, by all detectors to uh, classify the file. This value of cost is then multiplied by alpha. Alpha is a value that represents the relation between the reward function and the cost function. And we also have delta. Delta is a constant value that will be usually used when the alpha value is equal to zero, and it will be used in the cases where we don't want any relation between the cost function and the reward function. So this is our actual implementation. We have used four classifiers, uh, Manalyze, PE file, Byte 3 gram, and Opco 2 gram. We'll be presenting them in next slides. Um, here, the interesting, interesting thing we see is that there are so many options of defining the reward function. There are use cases where can, we can relate between the cost function and the reward function, and there are use cases where um, correct classification is dependent on the cost and incorrect classification is undependent of the cost. Now, when starting our research, we realized we need to be more familiar with uh, our field of research. So, so we actually decided to generate some malware classifiers by ourselves. Um, this slide um, will tell you somewhat of how to generate by yourself a malware classifier. So the first thing we need to do is to extract the features from the file. Specifically here, we see the operational codes of the file. Um, they are represented as byte trigrams, and they are ordered by the value of their term frequency. After extracting the features and ordering them, we'll be putting them into a model for the training phase. We use the random forest with 100 trees on the corpus of 30,000 30, files, both malicious and benign, and we generated a model. Of course, this model was test, and uh, at the bottom of uh, the slide, we see the results of our classifiers. We see that we have Manalyze with the accuracy value of 82%. We have PFAR with the accuracy of 90.6%, with the um, best time of 0 0.7 seconds for classifying a file. And we have the opco 2 gram with the most accurate accuracy, and the maximal time used for classifying a file. Now, to make our research as profound as possible, we uh, created a large surface of baselines and experiments. On the left-hand side, we see the baselines we've been using. We've been using four baselines. Um, each of the dots we see represents the a classification of a detector. A red dot means a detector classified the file as malicious, a green dot classified the file as benign. So we see four functions, the OR function, the majority vote function, the stacking function, where we've been using decision trees, and the non function. Non function indicates that we had only one classification from one of the detectors. On the experiment side, we had five main experiments that can be divided to two groups. The first group of the experiments are experiments one and two, where the reward function is always dependent on the cost function. In this kind of cases, we'll usually be maximizing the classification accuracy. The second group of experiments we had are experiments three to five, where the reward function of a, an accurate classification were independent on the cost function. In these use cases, we'll usually be maximizing the cost effectiveness that is dependent on the values of delta and alpha. So here we see the first result of our experiment. On the x-axis, we see the cost, and on the y-axis, we see the accuracy we received. Um, the blue dots represent the baselines, and the other dots represent our experiments. We see that the data on this graph can be clustered to two groups. One group is the high accuracy, high cost classifications, and the other group is the lower classification rate and lower cost rate. The interesting result we see here that in both cases, our experiments reach the highest classification accuracy as opposed to others without any further costs needed for classification. But looking further, in our experiments, we see a more interesting result. Um, we see that experiments one and two 
were very good, but when looking at experiment number three, we see that we've reached the accuracy of about 96% classification with only the fifth of the costs needed to classify these files. And this brings us to answering our first objective of our research, finding a cost-effective way for classifying um, files. Moving on to our second and third objective, um, we were dealing with the ability of our method to adapt to changes. Now, when talking about changes in the classification environment, there are mainly two types of changes. The first one is adding or removing a classifier, and the second one is any changes occurring to a specific classifier. We've been focusing on the second options, on the second option of uh, changes occurring to a specific classifier, since it's much more common. We decided to focus on the P file classifier, and we made three experiments. The first experiment will make him the best classifier ever found uh, without 100% accuracy. The second experiment will make him the worst classifier ever seen with 0% accuracy. And the third use case, experiment number three, is the use case of a classifier going out of date or um, out of... Uh, out of maintenance of uh, the organization. And here we decided to put the value of 50% accuracy when classifying. Now here we see the results. On the left hand side, we see the distribution of actions taken by the agent before any changes made to the P classifier. We see that the agent was using all classifiers he had, all four classifiers, and he reached the values of 96% uh, accuracy by the time of uh, ten, 10 seconds. Now, after making these changes on the right-hand side, we see the use case of 0% or 100% accuracy of the fee file, and we see that the agent realized it pretty fast and chose only the P file for his classification. So he received 100% accuracy at the time of only 0.7%, which is the time that takes a P file to classify a file. At the bottom right, we see the behavior of, the, of our agent when the classifier was acting with 50% accuracy. The agent realized that since it's not that accurate, he prefers not to use it at all. And we actually see the distribution of actions when the agent uses solely three classifiers instead of four. Now, the most interesting result um, that we're not presenting here is the fact that the time it took us to retrain our agent was only 2.5% of the time needed to, uh, to train the, the model when we only started. Now, this is one of the greatest features we have with reinforcement learning and allows us the ability of retraining our classification model. And this answers our second and third objective of, adaptically, of dynamically adapting, uh, dynamically and fastly adapting to changes in the classification environment. So, uh, lastly, I'll be talking about our future work. First, um, we are currently implementing our method on uh, cloud-based and serverless-based environments. Actually, on the AWS Lambda, we realized the, 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 we reduced the cost by 80% for uh, five classifiers. Secondly, we'll be training our model when the ability of sending a specific file to different classifiers parallelly which will create an exponential growth in the action space is currently under implementation. And thirdly, we would like to make our method as a whole when we will be treating instead of one file, we'll be treating batches of files. In order to do so, we'll be generating a multi-objective optimization problem when we'll be using two reinforcement learning algorithms, when one algorithm will be acting as the environment of the second algorithm. That's it, thank you very much.